In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, the One God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of all the worlds. We can never praise Him and thank Him enough for His divine intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and for Him raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide in the personage of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad as a follower and student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I cannot thank him enough and praise Master Farad Muhammad enough for preparing one for us today in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all of you, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, in the greeting words of peace, we say it in Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum. Brothers and sisters, we are very happy uh, this afternoon to have one of our most um, respected uh, ministers in the nation of Islam. I don't uh, stroke this brother and minister that you are about to hear from because he is my blood brother, but um, his work speaks for itself. And this uh, being uh, Easter Sunday, he has come prepared to teach on the subject, our culture, the culture of God. This day, which is celebrated in Christianity as the day that Jesus rose or, or was resurrected uh, from the dead. And well, there are a lot of, there's a lot of truth to be extracted from it, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of falsehood in it. And for many, many, many years, we have celebrated Christmas, we have celebrated Easter, and we have never really questioned the truth of these holidays because these dates are not even found in your Bible. There isn't much written on Jesus' birth. There's a lot written on his death and ascension they say he died on a Friday, right? And that he was dead for how many days? Three. A day contains 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 46 seconds, right? Round it off to 24 hours. Now, Friday to Saturday is 24 hours, right? Saturday to Sunday is another 24 hour period. Now, you count with me. I'm sure everybody in here has at least, at least attended kindergarten in their life. We learn simple mathematics, but that's 48 hours. So how is it that we celebrate it on Sunday? And we celebrate it on a different date every year. Is that right? Well, it would seem to me just like you were born on such and such day in such and such year. That day may change, but the date remains the same, right? I was born June 21st. 1964, the day of the week, I believe, I can't even remember, I think it was a Monday, I can't remember, but June 21st is my birth date. Well, that doesn't change, does it? The day of week may change on what day that falls on, but we know that is recorded. Now, as we were talking before coming out to you, 
Now you know 2,000 years ago, they had people who could record accurately the dates that these deaths and events took place. Huh? So how come we don't know the actual date since Jesus supposedly was delivered into the hands of the Roman authorities? You mean as great as Rome was, there is no actual record? Big question, right? We got records, birthdays, and deaths on everybody else. Now here is such a prominent individual in the land or in Palestine, and you mean to tell me uh, a, a sentence of this nature was not properly recorded? Big question. Well, we want to know the truth to this, but more importantly, we want to come up out of the false practices of our enemies and accept God's culture that has nothing to do with paganism. This is a pagan holiday. Oh, don't say that. It is. What does the Easter money and Easter eggs have to do with Jesus' resurrection? Talk to me. The painting of the eggs. Now, I know some of you may go away with a guilty consciousness because you, you know, were involved all week with your children painting eggs and hiding them in the garden. What, what does that all have to do with? A bunny and eggs? This is the celebration of a pagan holiday to the goddess of fertility. Where you think Playboy? Huh? <laughs> what is Playboy? Where did they get that from? Huh? The goddess I start her. This is what this day is all about. The pagans celebrated the right or the birth of spring coming out of winter into spring. It has something to do with the solstice and the sun. Jesus, where does this come in? See? And then you spend money again. All these holidays are commercial holidays. If they didn't have Christmas, if they didn't have Easter, if they didn't have Valentine's Day and all of these holidays that you go out and spend your money to buy new garments so that you can all be dressed up for Easter. Ah, oh, oh, I'm glad the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came and taught us a truth about our enemies. So I want you to sit back, make yourself comfortable, not too comfortable that you fall asleep. We will cool it off in here so that it doesn't get too comfortable that, that we don't um, take in the message. But I have the great honor of introducing to some and reintroducing to others my wonderful brother, Minister Rasul Muhammad. I thank Allah for him. Before I accepted my responsibilities in this great work of our father, Brother Rasul had already uh, been here in the United States, 1988. And we, of course, as many of you know, were taken to the country of Mexico many, many years ago in 1974, prior to the departure of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because he wanted to expose us to the Spanish-speaking people who are part of the original family and where our future work lies. We will expand our ministry and our ministries are being expanded to the Spanish-speaking people who occupy the majority of this territory hmm, in the Western world. Once you go, 
Once you go south of Texas, from Mexico all the way to the tip of Argentina, is Spanish, with the exception of Brazil, where they speak Portuguese. Is that right? Then in the islands you have Spanish, and then also you have some French, but the language that dominates this hemisphere is Spanish. And our people that live in Central America and South America, they are in dire need of this truth that they may also be empowered spiritually and economically that they may come out of the tyranny and the oppression that they have suffered under since the white man came over and imposed his culture and religion on them. So Minister Rasul helped Minister Farrakhan in 1988 and 89, touring the, the country, helping him to raise needed funds for the repurchase of the National Center. And as he was helping Minister Farrakhan, as he was still attending uh, college in Mexico at that time, the minister offered him, I would say in a very, um, um, how could I say? Well, he asked him to go into Detroit and to get his feet wet and just to go in there for a little while. All along, the minister <laughs> wanted him to take up that post. And so he told him, brother, go into uh, Detroit for about, I think it was 90 days uh, or three months. See how you like it. <laughs> and Minister Rasul went in there, was working with the laborers. Next thing you know, he became the minister of Muhammad's mosque number one. And Detroit and mosque number one became one of the most progressive and productive mosques under his administration. And uh, Detroit hosted the 1990 Savior's Day Convention, and to this day it remains one of the most successful Savior's Day conventions in the history of the Nation of Islam. Minister Rasul Mohammed was then relocated because of his tremendous work and progress made in Detroit to Miami, Florida where he went there, and like Detroit, but very few people to work with. And with his spirit, his great love, his administrative abilities, he went down there, immediately found a new place for the believers, has a beautiful, beautiful place in Miami, Florida. And those of you who are looking to go to Florida to vacation uh, this spring or summer, you need to take a visit to Muhammad's Mosque, number 29 in Miami, Florida. When you go there, you're going to see of every hue in your family. In Muhammad's Mosque, number 29, because of that, the diverse culture in Miami, we have Cubans in the mosque, Colombians in the mosque, brothers and sisters from Haiti, from the Dominican Republic, from Colombia, from Brazil, from Peru, from Jamaica. Oh yes. Now you may reject those people because of their different color of skin or the texture of their hair, but they are a part of the original family and they are Muslims by nature. So when you go to Miami, visit Moss number 29. He has the responsibility of just the south tip uh, uh, section or area of Florida and his responsibility is the whole entire Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, and all of South America where he travels extensively to set up study groups and take the message and the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to these people. So without further ado, will Mas Maryam open their hearts and their ears this day and help me to welcome the Nation of Islam's seventh 
regional minister, my brother, your brother, Minister Rasul Hakim Mohammed. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. In the most holy name of Allah, the all wise, true, and living God, to whom we are eternally grateful for his intervention in our affairs in the personage of Master Farad Muhammad, the supreme being to whom all holy praise are due forever. And though we thank Allah for Abraham, for Moses, for Jesus, for Muhammad the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon all of these worthy servants of Allah, we must be grateful and thank Allah for raising up one from among us. Some give him many different titles. To me, he represents proof. Proof that if God could raise up a man who only went to the third grade, learning the rudiments of reading, writing, and arithmetic, son of a Baptist preacher, we recently learned that he probably was born a few short miles outside of Sandersville, Georgia, in a place called Deep Step, Georgia, if that's not deep enough for you. We thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his work is still representing life to the entire world of the original people of God. We furthermore thank Allah that through the Honorable Elijah Muhammad we have today a leader, a teacher, a guide, and example of the kind of human being that we should be trying to cultivate in ourselves, and that is in the most beautiful, honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. My dear sisters and brothers, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to come before you this afternoon. I first thank my leader, the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the national laborers, in particular my brother, Minister Ishmael Mohammed, for his beautiful words and introductory of myself as he was going into, I guess you could call it somewhat of a resume. I got excited. I wanted to know who that person was too. That's a pretty interesting introductory. The responsibility is great. And any of us with any sense knows that the success of such a responsibility does not depend on one person, but on many of like heart and like mind and like spirit working together. My dear family, the topic that I chose to speak about or on today is entitled Our Culture the culture of God. And the reason that I chose that topic is because for quite some time now, I've been trying to develop a, I don't know if the proper word is style, a different style of teaching, but I got tired of watching people come out and get excited over the message but do nothing to improve their lives. You know, to educate means to guide. You may have a good educator, but if you're not a responsible learner, it all goes almost for nothing. So I chose to start teaching in a way where I ask you questions. 
I asked a question in a few lectures in the past that went as simple as this, and I found that most people could not answer it effectively. And the question was, who are you? And I want you to think about that question. Who are you? I've heard all kinds of answers. If it's a man, I'm a man. If it's a woman, I'm a woman. If it's a black man, I'm a black man. That's not who you are. That's what you are. And so I ask again, who are you? Well, my name is, no, 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 no. Not your title, not your name. Who are you? Well, I'm so much in height, I'm so much in weight, I have this texture here, I've got this. No, that's still telling me what you are. But you're still not telling me who you are. Another classic answer is, I'm an African American. That is definitely not who you are. Hmm? That's what you're trying to be. But it's not who you are. Who are you? And after I kept questioning the audience, and I've done it on several different kinds of audience, not just Muslims in the mosque, I've done it on college campuses. I've done it amongst the his so-called Hispanic people. They cannot answer that question. Who are you? Well, logically the question is, okay, then who am I? If you did not make yourself, and you didn't, then your identity lies in the origin of your make. In the Bible, although some Christians, some Muslims, and a whole host of other fools want to contend that God is not a man. And then they try and make God a space cadet or something that Stevie Wonder used to sing back in the 70s, 10 zillion light years away. But the Bible says, what you call the good book says, that to get acquainted with God is to get acquainted with self. Who am I? The Bible says, ye are all gods, children of the most high God. Who am I? I am God. That's the answer. I am God. Now, that should make you want to jump to your feet. But since you didn't, I'm going to have to explain myself. You say maybe that's going too far. You'd rather say uh, I'm a, a product of the Lord. Uh, I'm an extension of God. Uh, I'm a servant of God. See, whenever something is too heavy or big for you to explain, that's when you get humble. Well, to say I am God is not a matter of arrogant expression. Why don't you look at that word am? I am. See, what is so improper about the phrase, I am African American, or I am African, or I am a black man. It's an improper statement, because am in root means to become, meaning you're not that yet, but that's what you're trying to be. God is not really something you have to try and be, God is really a reality that you need to learn how to awaken in you. 
And that's why I chose the subject, our culture, the culture of God, because most of us don't know how to even answer the question, what is my culture? Hold it. The same kind of response that I got from the question, who are you? I got basically the same kind of response from, what is your culture? I asked one sister in West Palm Beach, Florida, what is your culture? And she said, my descendants are from Africa. My ancestors are from Africa. My, her my heritage is black. I said, sister, what is your culture? And she said, African. You, you know how y'all say it, you know, with a, like, don't you know what I'm talking about? And my response was, no, I really don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm asking you, but I don't know what you're answering. What is your culture? My culture is African. How's that? Now, if I say to you, if you ask me, uh, if I was from Panama, and you say, what is your culture? And I say, my culture is Panamanian. There's certain things you would expect from a Panamanian. He would speak Spanish. There's certain dress code. There's a certain diet. If I told you I was Cuban, if I told you that I was Chinese or Japanese or Korean or African from Africa recently, <laughs> it's a key point there. Timing is everything. There's certain things you could expect that would be expressive of that culture. But when you as a black man in America put on a kente cloth and make that a badge of your culture and don't know where the kente cloth came from. The kente cloth came from a family named the kente family in Ghana. They cultivated the design. You understand what I'm saying? They cultivated that design. That's not expressive of all of Africa. That's expressive of a family that underwent the training and the discipline to cultivate an artistic expression. You want to ride off of that? There's another design called the mud cloth. Who developed that? Some other family in Africa. So when somebody asks you, what is your culture, there's a great responsibility that it carries to answer the question of, what is your culture? And that responsibility is to be able to state with truth, what have you been cultivating? What are you doing? Real culture does not permit codependency in its expression or dependency. Now, let me give you an idea. My brother is the minister here. Now, if I, now, originally, I'm a musician. My brother can teach, I can sing and play the piano. At least for the last over 30 years, I've never known my brother to sing or play the piano. But because I sing and play the piano, and you ask him what is his culture, he can't say, well, I sing and I can play the piano. How you figure? Because my brother can play. <laughs> now, before anybody in here gets offended and tries to meet me in the parking lot, There is an aim with all of this. You see, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad really began, or better put, him and his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad, really initiated a new culture. All together. 
I can tell you something as simple as you might laugh, the bean pie. The first bean pie, according to what I was told, was made by Master Farad Muhammad himself. We joke around with it today. Bean soup, bean pie, bean bread, bean soda. Got some more than beans, my brother. <laughs> right? But what you're mocking is real culture. You don't have to dig back a thousand years. No, you can go to it. A man looked and studied the navy bean and cultivated a usage of that bean. That's culture. And you know what? That's our culture. Hmm? Think about this now. Our own expression. What I want you to see today, since that time, look over the last few decades, with the whole rise of black consciousness, what does it mean to be black? What is black culture? Everybody gives these different meanings to black culture. Anybody that walks with a limp, they walk in black. If a white person say, you should not shave, you should not shave, he talking, he talking black. Now, it's something we really have to study this. And I'm realizing, and I'm looking at how, no matter how we, quote unquote, walk black, talk black, in this sense, and dress black. Daishiki, kufi. Don't make a difference. All of the different African styles that we wear in America, our enemies are not intimidated. In fact, about it, they'll wear it too. I've seen a lot of white politicians come in for a vote with a kente cloth on and say, you know, um, uh, <laughs> it takes a village to raise a child. to as a black man with a high yellow expression I have to ask myself just objectively where are we going with this? Now if you went among the Chinese people or the Japanese people for example if you know anything about the Japanese language and culture, you would respect their culture by saying, not, yo, what's up, Mr. Uh, Hiroshima? You would go amongst the Japanese, and if you knew anything, you might say, os, o genki desu ka, Right? Well, I was wondering why the other day a brother called me up at the mosque, left a message on the service. Minister Rasul Muhammad, hotep my brother. A few minutes afterwards, another brother called up. Hotep my brother. This is now another thing. What are we, we're trying to get an identity here. Now anybody knows Muslims, you know, our cultural expression and greeting is, peace be upon you, we say assalamu alaikum. Some people for, pur for purpose, intentions, will not say that. When me and my brother were younger, we spent some time studying in Egypt. Now I had seen while I was in Egypt just about all kinds of our people from Africa. And there's one thing that I've noticed as a huge difference, huge difference. The expression of Africa from Africa is quite different from the expression of Africa from America. And you know what one of the fundamental differences that I've noted was? We say it not just with pride, but sometimes with arrogance. We put it on each other. Pow! 
And I wanted to look and study this thing. What I'm sharing with you today, I'm asking you to be objective. And I will open the floor for questions and answers, if it pleases Allah, when I'm through. I want to know what you think. But listen. Culture means to cultivate, to refine, to educate. The training and refinement of the mind, emotions, manners, taste, etc. The concepts, habits, skills, art, instruments, institutions, etc. of a given people in a given period, civilization. The raising, improvement, or development of some plant, animal, or product. When you talk about culture, you gauge culture in a people in this way. Sociologically speaking, culture is the ability of a cultural complex to keep pace with the changes in some other related aspect, as in the progress of social institutions to keep pace with the rapid advances in science. I listened to my leader, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, speaking with some of our Eastern Muslim brothers. And he made one remark that made a lot of sense to me. A lot of us trying to keep with tradition as we debate Sunnah, the Sunnah of the Prophet. Hmm? The Honorable Louis Farrakhan said, now you know we cannot bring the camel into the jet age. That wasn't mockery. It wasn't mockery. What our people wear in Africa, you may not want to wear that in Alaska. But what would a black man wear in Alaska to be expressive of his blackness, of his culture? He must be able to go in himself and cultivate a response to his environment. He must be able, this is where you, this is where culture comes from. Where you go inward and you cultivate a response to your own needs, to environmental needs. Do you understand? And since, from my standpoint, and I believe if you will take the time objectively to look at it, outside of the nation of Islam and the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I don't find nowhere where somebody is going inside to cultivate a unique response to the inevitable change in nature, time, environment, that's a winner. If you gotta go back to what was in Africa to be what you wanna be today, remember you're going back to a cultural state that was conquered. Listen very carefully. In as great as African culture is and was if it was so great where does God say in any scripture that that's one that will be preserved God says behold he's going to make all things new all things means that it's going to be a change in the way you think about yourself, your environment, your interaction. There will be a new theology, a new psychology that will bring about a new sociolo sociology, meaning in the way we relate to one another and express ourselves. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was preparing us for that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the 1960s wrote a letter 
and send it out to all of the women's training classes of the Nation of Islam called the MGT and GCC. He didn't want to see the sisters wearing African prints. He didn't even want them to wear braids or the hairstyles. This was not to say he didn't like Africa. But Mr. Muhammad was preparing you to become a new people. A new people. You don't go through over 440 something years of slavery. By God's permission. That's a key point. By God's permission, I don't care how emotionally upset you are over what a white man has done. He did what he did by God's permission. At a certain point, if you want to deal with the issue, you got to get it past and transcend your emotional response and look at God's intention, his purpose. Now you come on and deal logically with me. You think that God would allow another race to strip you, rape you, and rob you of what you called your culture then and leave you like a blank slate for centuries only to be awakened to go back into what was if you go back into what was it means that God didn't know really what he was doing now I can understand why? We want to be Kwame. Jufu and woo woo. I understand anything but nigga. I know, I know. I understand. And many of us just too impatient because Elijah gave you an X. Hmm? X. Let me tell you something. Everybody changed their name to any other name. Never got nobody's attention. When you got that X, everybody was like, what, what's that X? X? Mr. X? Uh, Miss what? X? Boy, don't tell me Elijah didn't have power. He gave you a letter and you got more response than the whole title. Huh? he trying to do don't get mad at him among artists we say an artist creates and a critic destroys and if you walk up on an artist while he's working the canvas before he's done it may look strange Just like if you walk in the kitchen before mama's done with the cooking, it looks strange. And she know it looks strange. That's why she said, get out of here. It ain't time for dinner yet. <laughs> oh, but when it's done and that bell rings, you the first to burp. <laughs> what is God doing? What is he doing? Why did God put an ordinance in nature that requires every human being, black, brown, red, yellow, or white, five foot two, four eleven, or six six? The ordinance in nature is that every living creature must undergo pain, sacrifice, struggle, difficulty. Why? 
This is precisely what we try to avoid in life. But this is exactly what agitates growth. The fifth principle in Islam is significantly called Hajj. Hajj, standing for pilgrimage, or the journey that every Muslim makes at least once in his lifetime. Some scholars write that Hajj is really derived from the name Hajar. Hajar meaning Hagar. which the Islamic scholars refer to as the black Ethiopian handmaiden of Abraham. And the Hajj, the pilgrimage that is made, is made to a cube, which is called one of the oldest houses of worship on the face of the earth. Hmm? Empty inside, made of brick and stone with a black veil over it. My father once said, he said, I looked at this here Kaaba and I recognized that it represented myself. <laughs> that Allah would raise an uneducated man. Hmm? And he would bring him to such height, such wisdom, that it would produce like a magnetic force that would draw the whole of humanity to evolve around that wisdom. That wisdom would begin to cultivate a new being. Y'all all right? Look at some of the African history and culture. There's a term you find, ba ka. Ba meaning soul. Ka meaning like body double. You find it in Egyptian culture and history. In the Egyptians, they had these tombs. The bar represented the soul and the car represented the tomb and the place where they believed some of them went into superstitious thinking that they believed that the soul returned and they wanted to prepare a place. You see? And sometimes they went to painstaking efforts to make that the, the, the tomb with almost every detail of that person mummifying putting even the little trinkets and the things that that person enjoyed while they lived. Look at that, ba ka B-A, huh? K-A. Soul, double. Now you turn it around when you get into Middle East and it's ka -ba. Could it mean the same thing? Why not? As it is in heaven, huh? On earth. It's supposed to be a replica of what it is in heaven. Now let's try and understand this. Some go so far as to say that where the Kaaba is situated is precisely, it's under a replica that they believe in some celestial heaven. There's a replica of it. Think over this. But what does it really represent? Well, Jesus answered it in this word, in these words. The kingdom of God is within. Which means that the real church 
the real synagogue, the real mosque, the real masjid, the real temple, the real house of worship is you. Not these four walls. Well, you say, well, if it's not these four walls, what's the importance of it? This serves as a training ground. This serves as a way station to weigh your character, train you and cultivate in you the necessary attributes so that God can flow through you. Our culture, the culture of God. Now, how do you get into such culture? Well, there's so much focus now on Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity is fine, but it's limited. Some of you just don't want to venture that far to think that way because you're spooky. You feel if you were to accept that concept, you lose an identity. Africa, in all of its glory, is too limited as a definition for who I am. Look at this. Leroy Jones is now Kwame, an African-American. And that black man is older than the term Africa. How old is the term Africa? Hmm? Since the beginning of time. Africa can't be more than five, six, seven hundred years old. The term. All right, let's go to Africa. Let's ask our brother in Africa, where you from? You go and you're into the deep brush. And eventually you find tribes, when you start talking about where you're from, where's the origin of you, they start pointing up. What do you mean pointing up? There's a Dogen tribe that points to what the white folks call the Sirius star or the Dogen star. And they know that it comes into, um, they can see it every 60 years. They draw it on a rock without a telescope. Hmm? Let's go ask the Egyptian. Let's study it deep. Where did they come from? Eventually, everybody starts pointing up. Why do they start pointing up? Because even the planet we stand on, is too young relative to the depths of our identity. It's not enough. I don't care where you go on 196,940,000 square miles or whether you go to the top peak 29,141 feet high of Mount Everest, there is no part of the earth that is the sum of who you are. I don't know if it's true or not, but I asked a sister who was the secretary as a young sister for Master Farad Muhammad in Detroit, Sister Bernstein Muhammad, who's married to one of the brothers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my uncle John Muhammad. She told me one day in the class, a brother raised his hand and asked the Savior, he asked the question, if the black man was here before the planet, how did he travel? And she said that she recalled the Savior saying, that he traveled in and out of orbs. 
Now, you remember last time I was here, I told you a statistic that's very real. 98% of the American people are scientifically illiterate. So generally, when we get to this kind of point, either some fall asleep or the others just say, mm-hmm. <laughs> Orbs are basically celestial bodies. It's energy. See, many have the concept, the only thing, they can't think of man in any other sense other than sex. But man in root really means mind. The sex and the form evolved out of God's perception of himself interacting with his creation. I want you to think about this. Look at this. Y'all all right? Listen, whether it's true or not, I don't know. This is what she said. But it makes sense. Scientists who do study on the brain, white scientists, you know, the brain is still such a mystery, you know? They said if we could see what a thought looks like, it looks like a current of electricity. And you know, when you're trying to remember something, he said it's not, there was one white scientist said it's not, it's not phenomenal that people hit their head to try to remember. <laughs> they said because the way memory and thought works in the brain, it's like a current of electricity. And when you can't remember, it's really like a current that's not getting across from one part to another part of the brain. And so it's not strange that you do like this here as if it's going to help it jump over. <laughs> but now one thing fascinating that they said was they said once a new idea is introduced to the brain the brain that mind cannot return ever to its previous dimension of thinking and this is why the white man's world, which really is a mind field, they are so fearful of people like Louis Farrakhan. Because his mind has really become a channel through which the wisdom of God flows. I mean, every time he opens his mouth, it's like, Good, 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 I mean, the flies are bombs. Pia, pew, pop, pew. I mean, everybody just get, you, everybody gets touched. The danger is that all you have to do is come under that word. Even if you reject it, it's too late. It's too late. It got you. It's already affecting you. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, it's like the light of the sun that hits the equator of the planets. It don't make a difference if the planet is 4 billion, 600 million miles away like that of Pluto or the closest like Mercury or the third one like Earth. All of them are set into motion regardless to the kind of life it produces because that's the way the light is. That's the way truth is. When it hits the equator of your thinking, it brings about a change in your rationalizing. It changes your logic. It changes your perception of reality. Reality. Can't help it. All praise is due to Allah. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, I'm not here to make a nation of followers, but a nation of gods. Which means that the kind of mind Elijah Muhammad was commissioned to produce. The kind of mind he was commissioned to cultivate is one that would really, that would really be a fulfillment of something that's written in the book of Hebrews 10, 16. A covenant that God makes with the people in the last days. 
He said that he would put his law into the hearts of men. And upon their minds would he write. Well, if that means he's going to write on the minds, it ain't talking about with a ballpoint pen. It's talking about where revelation would flow. Huh? And you know what triggers that revelation? See, God ain't never went to the real so-called educated. He always went to the so-called uneducated. See, the less you think you know, the less hindrance you will give to his transmission. When you think you know, you get in the way with what you could know. Oh, ain't no question about that. Look at how arguments are waged. How many times do you see arguments where two people are saying the same thing? And you on the sideline say, how come they can't hear each other? It's real. Listen to this. He's cultivating a mind. Where in God, wait, wait, let me back up real quick. I want you to follow me with, with something and, and, and then give me, you know, you can criticize it. Because I keep getting challenged on God is a man, God is a man, God is a man, God is a man. And I'm challenged now in three languages. <laughs> and what I did one day, and it made so much sense to me, and it came to me on the spot, I said, let's look at the first man. God shapes and fashions this first man out of clay or dust or or for those who need to hear it, black mud. And he made this form. But the form didn't make him a man. Just look at the scriptures. It didn't, he wasn't a man yet. And he wasn't alive. Until what? Oh, 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 okay, so you know the scriptures. Now, check this out. Now, everybody knows that God breathed. Everybody knows this, right? Especially those that say God is not a man. But now, check this out. Now, are you sure it says breathe? It doesn't say he blew. Because we all know if God had blown into the form, how do you do that? <sighs> now, if the scripture said God blew, <sighs> then it'd be hard for me to believe that God is a man. But since the scripture say he breathed into the form, and then what happened? It became a what? A living soul. Is that right? A living soul. Now, everybody in here know how to breathe? When you breathe, there is one essential function you must do. What's that? Huh? Somebody's saying exhale. Y'all still stuck on that movie. Look. The, the essential thing that you must do to breathe is <gasps> inhale. Now, how could God breathe into the form and not be in there to inhale? It's just a, another angle at looking at it to bring it crystal clear to you. If the, the form wasn't doing it on its own, God got in there and start going <sighs> and the fact that God was in the form it's called now a living soul now what is a soul? 
soul is defined as the principle of life. The principle of life. Look at that. The principle. That's a law, the rule. The principle of life is man. If that's not saying God is a man, what is? But there's an argument that usually comes up, but I mean, come on now, man. You know, five foot ten. Man, even oak trees are taller than man. Why did God make man so apparently physically fragile? You ever think about that? I mean, I mean, if you play around with the idea of it, you say, well, good God, I mean, it would have been nice if God had made me out of rock. <laughs> I would have to worry about getting shot, beat up. <laughs> Don't mess with me, you hurt your hand, you know. I made a rock, you know. The Lord make me like a rock. I mean, why flesh? I mean, it cuts so easy. We bleed. Hmm? And, we, and, and even the tallest of us are short, midgets, dwarfs, in comparison to lesser creatures. Do you know what it, I think it is? I think that God made a form that would be expressive of one of his chief attributes. Now, I want you to, before I tell you what that attribute is, I want you to think about this. Put yourself in the mind of a creator. God, which is not physical and material, creates a material universe. Well, don't you want to enjoy what you create? Well, I think that God did a masterful work in making this vehicle to be the vehicle through which he could enjoy his creation because he didn't make it so big that it would get in the way of the rest of his creation. He made it small enough, light enough in weight that it could appreciate the blade of grass, the warmth of the sun, the mountains, the majesty of trees. You see what I'm saying? What is the chief attribute? Humility. Humbleness. Humility. And that's why you can't see God in you. Because pride is looking for its reflection. And in the nature of man, it's not there. Now, let's see if we can understand why God puts an ordinance of pain, struggle, sacrifice, difficulty. Because something that sacrifice, struggle, difficulty, and pain assaults directly is pride. My father used to say to us when we were little, he said, if you want to get to know somebody, make them mad. Oh, yeah, when people are mad, they say all kind of stuff. They let it come around and say, oh, man, you know, I, I was just mad, you know. I didn't really mean what I was saying. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. Because I stirred up your Leviathan. That monster that come up out of the sea that really means coming up out of your own being. When it's agitated, there's a monster that comes out. The real you. The incomplete you. Is that right? Uh huh. So, the ordinance of pain appears to be set to directly challenge or end to wage a constant war with pride. You see, for God to make this his house, huh? Pride cannot be there. Arrogance cannot be there. Marriage is called a divine institution. It ain't a contract of passion. 
For the white man it is, marriage for the white, in the white man's world is legalized fornication. But in God's world, the divine institution of marriage is an arena that directly, and now I'm speaking from experience, it, marriage, assaults pride. Marriage attacks pride. Whenever you want to say, I am, there's these little voices saying, we too. <laughs> Marriage huh? helps to further agitate growth and you cannot come into your complete maturity outside of God's prescribed institution for the development and cultivation of himself in you outside of marriage. You understand? The white man's world facilitates a way for you to dip in dodge commitment. And as you dip and dodge commitment, he can permeate fear in you that subjects you to submission to his law. To submit means to surrender. It means that you are overpowered. But in a commitment, there's a willing devotion. And if you're not willing to devote yourself to a woman, to a man, What does the Bible say? As you call it, the good book. The old good book says, if you look at a woman and lust, you have falsely defined God's creation. You know there's a principle in that. If you look at, if you look at a woman in lust, you have falsely defined God's creation. Well, if you look at yourself in the wrong manner, Huh? You also likewise have falsely defined God's creation. So that's why your concept of culture is not in sync with the cultivating purpose that God has designed for you in this time to start moving towards. You off base. Out of whack. Out of step. And you don't really look like a people of culture. You look like Halloween. Why would the white man get in the middle of that? What you weigh ain't never going to affect nobody. But it's how do you dress your mind? I bring this to a close. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his representative, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, are the true culturists. They are the ones who advocate and devote themselves to the general cultural advancement of our people. In culture, there is responsibility which means to be response-able, able to respond, to change. That's inevitable. Now, you see the styles of bell bottoms are back, right? People are gonging down the streets nowadays. Rubber and plastic and poly and ester, all of them are back now. Right? Where do we see all of this? In the 60s, right? 60s and the 70s. Won't be long before platform shoes are back. They're already back. They got platform sneakers now. Hey. Right? Now, what does that tell you, tell you when the fashions are going back? They're bringing back the past. On the West Coast, the Latino the, or the Chicano brothers, they brought back the zoot suits. What is that saying? 
That saying, nobody's coming up with nothing new. That means that our cultural expression in that department is experiencing an arrested development. Is that right or wrong? Well, likewise, when a black man says, I'm now conscience, and in your so-called conscienceness, you're trying to go back to the Sudan of a thousand years ago. You are experiencing an arrested development, which means you have not yet learned why God allowed you to come so far for you to have to go back When have you seen a leaf back up into the branch of a tree to define itself? Or a branch swallow back up into the bark to define itself? No, everything keeps going forward. The, uh, the seed starts growing roots, going down, then a stem goes up, bark, branches, leaves, leaves die, go back to the earth, form soil and uh, 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 fertilize the ground for new growth. But there's a constant evolutionary change. Nothing goes back. Only you do. <laughs> Only you do. You the only ones that do that. I don't mind you getting mad with me. I don't live here no more. <laughs> Ish Ishmael got to deal with this, right? <laughs> I'm just starting fires and getting back on the plane. <laughs> I hope that you are being open-minded and objective to think because I don't want you to make the big mistake that many of us are making and ungratefully overlook the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his representative, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. See, this world tries to produce conformists. And, and we even go so far as to have black conservatives in America. You know what we need to do with all black conservatives? Anyone that even dares to call themselves a black conservative, they need to be taken down into the center of the city or in the recreational squares of all the projects and somebody just start beating their backside with a stick. You know why? That means you about maintaining things the way they are. You're trying to preserve. Preserve what? Are you out of your mind? We're crazy. We're insane people. You know what insane means? It means a person that does the same thing over and over again expecting different results. That sound like you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop because some of y'all gonna wait for me in the parking lot. And... Then, I'm, then I'm gonna have to put a move on you. No, <laughs> <laughs> My dear beloved family, we, are in, we have entered a time period that requires us to begin anew. Africa needs you. And rest of the whole world too. Nobody has gone through what you've gone through to the degree that you've gone through it. Now, if something great don't come out of that, then we got to really sit down and have a talk with God. Hmm? You are a magnificent people. You are a fabulous people. You are a Gorgeous people. Your beauty is not 
in your cheekbones. Look at she got them high cheekbones. Hell, if you got cheeks, you got it going on. <laughs> she got that good hair. If your hair ain't falling out, that's good hair. <laughs> we are fantastic people. We are wonderful people, full of wonder. Can't nobody figure us out. We can't figure ourselves out. Hmm? Again, your beauty is not in your height, in your mass. And I have to take the further step. It's not even in your color. Your hue. You see, many black activists and well-intended individuals have talked up the beauty of this in order to restore a degree of self-esteem. I have a problem with that methodology because you don't acquire self-esteem without self-knowledge. And if you have the real self-knowledge, you'll find where self is interwoven in everything in creation. Everything. Your beauty is in that you are the perfect conductor of God. You are everything now that was, is, and with the capacity to create anew. That's you. You are everything, every thought that was ever thought. Every feeling. Every bit of talent. All of the was is in you right now. You're made up of genetics. It's information. You are a computer. You're a microchip. All the data is there. You I book. You just don't know how to activate your power. You are born powerful. Powerful. Full of power. But if you look up the word power, power means capacity too. You got the capacity to, the potential to, but you lack force. Force is active power. You don't know how to activate who you are. We can offer you the answer. The way you activate power, it, since power rightfully is God, the only sure way to activate power is submission to God. There it is. There it is. Just submit to God. All right? Get rid of this ego tripping. Okay? Just submit to God. Start praying more. Prayer is so powerful. Prayer facilitates intercourse of your mind and spirit with the mind and spirit of God. Pray. Fast. And not just from food. But practice fasting or abstaining from all urges so that you can be cognizant of the degree of your own submission to that which you say you believe in. Because when you can tell yourself not to eat, and it's natural to eat, and you can tell yourself not to have sex, and that's natural too. And you can tell yourself not to go to temptations. 
Hmm? That is doing something. It's cultivating a character through which the wisdom of God will always be secure. But I must remind you, wisdom was never meant for weak character. And that's why wishful thinking without the disciplinary training, it cultivates characters to support it is never granted because God is a just God. I know some of you are praying for all kind of blessings and you wonder why God ain't answered you yet. Because God is a just God. You ain't ready for what you're asking for. So I conclude by thanking you, thanking my dear beloved brother, Minister Ishmael, Muhammad, and the National laborers, our beloved leader, whom I love with all my heart, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for this wonderful, blessed opportunity just to agitate your thinking. You know, and I, felt, I feel now that as a minister or a preacher or whatever, when I come before people to speak, if I don't do nothing but agitate thinking, I've done a really good thing. Because that's what people are not doing enough of, thinking. I asked my brother if it would be all right, and maybe for maybe five minutes or so, anyone would like to ask a question. If there's anyone that would like to ask a question, yes, dear brother. Walaikum salam. I'm sorry? Thank you, dear brother. Very, very, very good question. My brother is asking about where's, what is the difference between the Latino, Hispanic, and Chicano communities, or, or actually the terms because that's where the differences are. More so you'll find those of the original people that will go by the term Chicano in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California, the West Coast. You won't find many who will go under that title in Florida. Chicano is really a term that is derived from the, I believe it's the Nahuatl tongue, that really refers to those people from, as they call it, the nation of Aslan. And these are really so-called Mexican-Americans who have come over looking for opportunity and ran into racism, discrimination, and prejudice. But yet they're reconnected to the history of how the seven states that used to be a part of Mexico, California, Nevada, what is it, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, um, I think Colorado, these used to be part of the Mexican states and the indigenous people there. And so many of them like to call themselves Chicano and really at the despise of many of the classist Mexicans in Mexico who feel that the Chicano is giving an ill representation of the Mexican in Mexico who wants to be more acceptable to the European and the white American. Chicano is two words, chiquisilla, which means children, cano, which means land. And so when they say Chicano, they're consciously referring to themselves as the real children of the land. Now when we move over into Florida, you've got like 33% of the population in Dade County, which is where Miami is situated, is Cuban, as they say. Some say Hispanic, but we know the numbers are largely Cuban. And 97 to 98% of that 33% are what we call in Florida white Cubans. And there's a large number of that number 
which are as Gloria Stefan, the singer, calls it, Jubins. The Ashkenazi uh, uh, strain of Jews uh, from Northern Europe and Poland and whatnot who came into Cuba. There's a very interesting story. The conscience, so-called Hispanic, meaning conscience of the colonizing of the European of the mind and the culture of the indigenous people reject the term Hispanic because it ties them to Hispaniola, which is from Spain. You see? And they would prefer to go under titles like Chicano or they'll choose a, you know, I'm Dominican or I'm uh, um, from Mexico, but I understand my roots, whether it be Toltec, Aztec, uh, uh, Mayan or Olmec or whatever tribe they choose. But in Florida, it's a little different. In New York, you got a lot of Puerto Ricans. You, in Chicago, you got a lot of Puerto Ricans and you got a whole lot of Mexicans too. But it depends on the conscience state how they accept or reject the title. Latin, Hispanic, or Chicano. They're right now, if you speak, you're from Michigan? Well, in, at, I, I'm, I think I'm due to be at Michigan State University on the 11th of next month for a Chicano, a national Chicano student assembly kind of thing. And they invited me because they want to learn from the discipline and the structure of the nation of Islam how to awaken the consciousness of their people. very beautiful because they realize how they have been literally robbed of their own history contributions culture lives you name it you see if you do a little research in how this American government thinks at the turn of the century somewhere down around the period of the Spanish American war you find President Adams saying that Cuba is like a fruit ripening on the tree of Spain, which means it is soon to fall. And when it falls from the tree of Spain, it will fall right into the hands of the U.S. And that's exactly what happened with Cuba, Puerto Rico, and they both have had some struggles for independence. Study the Batista regime in Cuba from 1950 to 1959. Look at the territories that were owned by the US, AT&T for an example, and other big American companies owned the wealthiest lands in Cuba. Study the condition of black people in Cuba. Cuba is 70% black. Venezuela, many people don't understand when they see about Venezuela, they see these light-skinned Venezuel Venezolanos as we say in Spanish, no. Venezuela is 80% black. Many are still quoting that Brazil is 60 to 80 million black people, the largest amount of black people outside of Africa in any place. Correct, but the number is larger. The last statistic that was done back in 1993, I believe it was, showed that black people in Brazil number over 105 million. And the same is as you go into Paraguay, Uruguay, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, Chile. It doesn't make a difference. Going to Costa Rica, the seven countries of Central America, the 13 countries of South America is black all over. There. Going to Mexico, you go a few miles south of Acapulco, where everybody's going to have a vacation. And you'll run into little pueblitos that are all black, as black as everybody in this room. Hablando perfectamente bien el español. You go up into the state of Veracruz, whole little pueblitos, little towns preserved, all black, speaking Spanish. It's very deep. It's very deep. It's very deep. But thank you for your comment. Yes, dear brother.
It's a culture that evolved in truth. He's asking about, you know, um, the different stereotypes. I, I, I gather that's what he's talking about. The stereotype about blackness, and it often wondered why so much stereotyping. He made mention of a um, uh, black sambo. What we're talking about with black sambo and all of these other um, derivatives referring to black is really a culture that has evolved from slavocracy. It's a slave culture that permeates an ill perception of blackness in order to facilitate an authoritative standard and a, a perspective of Anglo-Saxons, white folks. And it's so, and it's deeper than black sambo. It really is at the base of the very institutions that we go to for help, such as the Association of Psychiatry and Psychology in this country, who still holds and has not disputed nor uh, repudiated or gotten rid of its founding father's concepts who went into thinking that the blacker the individual, the less intelligent, the lighter, the more intelligent. And they had different uh, 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 psychologists who went into Africa and they studied how submissive black people were and one of them sent back documentation of his accounts of black people in Africa and he said, these blacks caught slavery like that of a spaniel would to his master. Spaniel meaning a dog. Courting means that we adapt to it. We relate to it almost by nature. That is the humble or the, uh, the aspect of humility in our nature, but it has got nothing to do with inferior complex. See, we didn't have a problem with color. They had a problem with color. We didn't see the white man and say, oh, there's a problem here. No, the white man saw the black man and said, there's a problem here. You, you see what I'm saying? Now, in conclusion on that, it is very elevating means to break up the surface soil around plants in order to destroy weeds, prevent crusting, or preserve moisture. If you look at the sperm, the seed of life, looks like a little tadpole, right? But we know that all the genetic information, all the power, all the capacity is in the head. And it instinctively travels towards the egg and when it smashes up into the egg, once it penetrates the egg, it breaks down the surface of that head so that its potential and its capacity, its information can start going into operation. Now, what needs to be done and what is already taking place, especially, thank God, as a result of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Thank God as a result of the continued teaching of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, it's breaking down the head, the surface of this imposed, imposed racism. We don't even need white folks around to be racist and discriminative towards each other. We got light-skinned brothers and light-skinned sisters and dark-skinned brothers and dark-skinned sisters and uh, sisters with straighter hair and sisters with more stronger hair. We make difference out of it because it's still part of the slave culture. You see? This was what must be broke down, but as we're breaking down and chiseling off the surface of this sickness, we got to be very careful that we don't, like for an example, and we're trying to retrace our roots, don't get stuck in your root. You understand? Everybody with any degree of black consciousness gives the same old phrase. You got to know where you came from in order to understand how you got to where you are so that you can be able to plan where you want to go. You understand what I'm saying? Now, ebonically speaking, I understand what you're saying, but the point is, as you study your past, don't get stuck there. And that's what many of us have done. We've gone backwards in time and got stuck there. 
Do you understand? Maybe two more and we got to close. Yes, ma'am. Travel in and out of orbs. Look up the term O-R-B in the dictionary. Orb. There you go. Look it up in the dictionary. Like I said, that's what she said. It may be true, it may not be true, but the point is, is there any significance in it? Well, if you understand anything about energy or celestial bodies, it makes a lot of sense because you know that God in the beginning, or when he, see, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not separate God from man. You see, man in this form is the evolution of the revolutionized uh, 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 form that came after his creation. For this form to exist, we need oxygen. We need water, we need the earth. But for the mind, we don't need it. You see? But see, in reality, the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he doesn't separate the two. It's one. One times 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 one still equals one. It's still the one God over here in this sister. It's still the one God in this brother over here. One times one times one times one. Not one plus one plus one plus one. Though we have multiplied in essence, we, I mean, though we have added on, but in essence, we have only multiplied that one, still being one. Do, do, do you understand? Real quick. Y yes, dear brother. I'll get you, my brother. Yes, sir. Of the, uh, what is it? He Heaven's Gate? Well, you want my comment? I don't know. I wasn't a part of the group. You know, I, 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 it's good to see you, dear brother. And, uh, but, but, but in truth, you know, I, I know people always want to know, you know, how, what's, what's wrong with it? Look, we have entered in a very crazy time period. White folks know their time is up. And, 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 and they thought that they was going to escape uh, this to go somewhere else, but ain't nowhere else to go. Uh, them folks ain't never coming back. Um, that's it. I don't know about them. I wasn't a part of them. Um, we don't know too much about death. Uh, our study and our culture is life. Yes, dear brother. Say that again. How could Allah manifest himself in what? From nothing. You know, I've heard that term nothing dealt with before. You see, in the English language, most of the words, that, that's what makes, you know, and, and I'm going I'm to I'm I'm make this statement. I want you all to all think about this. I believe that you will find this to be 100% true. There's no language on the face of the earth where there are more active arguments than in the English language. And the reason for that is because most of the terminologies and the words in the English language are all ambiguous. They're relative terms. Like for an example, nothing is a relative term. It's impossible for there to be nothing if something came out. You see? So what, what, is, what is he saying then? For an example, he said it was triple darkness. Well, the mere fact that it was triple darkness means there was a degree of light. There was three degrees of light. Why wasn't it double dark? Why wasn't it just dark? Now, it was triple darkness. That means there was a degree of light. There was something there. You see? But it looked like nothing because it was nothing to calculate until whatever it was sparked and came forth. Look at it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, there sparked an atom of life. Spark means there was friction. If there was friction, there was mean there were two forces in the dark wrestling with one another. 
Huh? Think about it now. Your mind works the very same way like that, drop, like that triple darkness. You put in a situation that is hostile, that forces you now and demands of you to come up with an idea of how to relieve yourself of this hostility. Is that right? So you wrestling in the dark. The dark means ignorance. The dark means I don't know what to do, but I'm fighting this thing. And then all of a sudden there's spots. Oh, I got it now. I'm going to go this way. There's spots, an idea. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that first atom that sparked out of triple darkness was an atom of thought. It was an atom of thought. You could also understand from this that the triple darkness really was like a mind field. See, think about it. What is mind? I didn't say what is brain. What is mind? Mind is not flesh. Mind is not material. Mind is not mass. Mind is really a field of energy. Huh? And in that field of energy, there sparked an idea. Look at it. The Holy Quran is written so beautifully. When it, wherever the Quran says, say, say he Allah is one, say, Allah says be, say, that's activating a thought. Word means sound of an expressed thought. And when God says say, he's putting into motion, he's activating the idea. And that sparked the matter of life. And then now it's twisting and turning in the dark, emanating light from it. It evolves and twists and turns. God says be, be is a verb, action word. God says be and it is. But what we got to do is come out of Walt Disney. We got to come out of fantasy land and understand something. Check this out. I'm going to drop something on you. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad once said with a question that was placed to him at the, at the dinner table. He's referring to how long did it take him to come out of the dark. You know, all of us dropping questions that are heavier than we can chew, right? Someone just ask deep questions just for the hell of it. Did you see me ask that question? <laughs> you know? And if they think it's big, say, I got them stuttering. <laughs> but no, it's true. Some of us ask questions that are important, and, but they may not be relative to where you are right now. And that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to say, stop the believers from sciencing up on everything. We want to go all deep in the pyramid and this diametric measurement to the constellation, understand me here, where uh, the finks understand what I'm saying. But okay, what I'm going to talk about is how the sands in the Sahara, right? Okay. You see, what you smoking, my brother? Listen to this. That sparked an atom of life. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, when he was questioned, the question was, how long did it take him? And he said, well, he had to wait for brain cells to develop in order to think his way out of the dark. What all of this is pointing to is that even in creation, see, we want to make God more, and more is relative to your ignorance because, you know, you want to make it more. More what? You are a miracle. How many brothers in here married? Let me see your hands. How many brothers in here got, got children? Raise your hands. Isn't it miraculous how you had sex and passed that woman some foggy fluid and all of a sudden she starts swelling up? And then all of a sudden you went and got an ultrasound with her and you saw something beating and moving and breathing and, and then all of a sudden you saw this baby come out. And then when you looked again, the baby was walking. Then you looked again and the baby was talking. Good God Almighty, that's a miracle, man. to make it nothing more than that. That's this deal with that. <laughs> I 
Hell, man, that's spooky, too. When my wife was pregnant, man, and I, I felt all three trimesters. When she said, I, I was feeling it, too. I said, did you feel that? I don't know what the heck was the matter with me. <laughs> I ain't been myself since then. <laughs> it's incredible. We ain't got to make it more than that. But now, let me close it. Look at this. Everything is in a process. It's in a process. It's in a process. That's how he did it. Nothing is a relative term. Something is a relative term. Nothing could be relative because there was nothing that a certain kind of sight could see. You see? Look at the world. The world is looking at us right now, looking at our generation. They don't see nothing there. And that's relative to what they think they can use. But the world sees nothing in black folks, but God sees something in black folks. Now, look at that. Last question. Somebody had to... Oh, my sister's standing here. Yes, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Walaikum salam. That is beautifully put. That will be the last question and comment of the afternoon, and I think it's perfectly on time. In fact, about it, the work is out in the streets. But make no mistake about it, we didn't pop up in here magically. Where you think we came from? But that means we have to keep going out. Keep going out. This is but a way station. Those who become members of the mosque are those who have determined that they are going to dedicate their life, their time, their talent, their energy, and whatever they can spare of their finance to make a difference out in the street. Our Tony, is there anyone in here that has never sinned in their life? Please don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you. Because I might know you, don't you? <laughs> the Quran says that if Allah were to judge man by his sins there wouldn't be one of us left alive upon the face of the earth so that means every one of us to some degree to lesser or more degree than the person next to you has sinned well the atoning process is going out there and saving the life of someone you remember the eight steps of atonement the Honorable Louis Farrakhan taught us? Point out the wrong, acknowledge the wrong, confess the wrong first to God and then to the person whom you've wronged. Repent for the wrong which requires changing of your mind and your thinking about a particular act or deed committed. Number five is to atone. Atone means you've got to do something now to amend for what has, gone, what has been wrong. Is that right? You've got to do something about it. Number six is forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean to forget. That's why some of us don't forgive. We say, I ain't going to ever forget. I'm nobody telling you to forget, but forgive. Forgive means let go of that reality. Because when you fail to forgive, you become an accomplice to the crime. You didn't hear me. When you fail to forgive, you become an accomplice to the crime. And any time you do not let go of a negative reality, you start assimilating that reality and reproducing the act. The seventh step is restoration and reconciliation. And the eighth step is perfect union. None of us have atoned until we've gone out there and helped somebody who's sick. Thank you so much for listening. Love you, Chicago. Assalamu alaikum. Dear 
sisters and brothers. Now, how many of you believe that what you've heard today and what you already know of the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his representative, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, is good for our people and more people need to hear this teaching. Could I just see by showing of hands? Wonderful. Now, not everybody raised their hand. I don't know if that means you don't feel like it, but you did come. And I, I would not think that you came for any other reason than to learn. And I hope and pray to Allah that we did that part in showing you something today. But now, let me ask you this. How many of you love your people? Very good. Do you know that in all civilized languages, love, L-O-V-E, is a verb? Which means it's an action word, active word. Which means that if you love somebody or someone, that love must be proactive to, in order to be justifiably loves. Meaning to love your people now means you must be actively involved in helping your people in the areas of concern. So I want everybody registered or not registered in the mosque to repeat after me. I state your name, Rasul, pledge from this day forward to love my brothers and sisters as I love myself. How many of you believe that you could use some improvement in your own character and in your own life? Very good. I better not catch no hands down. I'll give you another two hour lecture on pride. Then I want everybody to repeat after me. I state your name, Rasul. Pledge from this day forward to study to improve myself spiritually, morally, mentally, physically, and economically for the benefit of myself, my family, and my people. How many of you believe that we're in need of hospitals, schools, housings, businesses, more farmland? Very good. Then everybody repeat after me. I, I state your name, Rasul, pledge from this day forward to help build schools, hospitals, housing, buy farmland, and enter into international trade and commerce for the benefit of myself, my family, and my people. Last but not least, it is very important that we say this. Please repeat after me. I state your name, Rasul, pledge from this day forward to give of myself, my time, my talent, my energy, and whatever I can spare of my finance to accomplish the before mentioned. And because of the danger in the time that we're living in, I'm going to ask you to make this pledge with me. I state your name, Rasul, pledge from this day forward to never lift my hand to strike or shed the blood of any human being unless in self-defense. Praise be to Allah. Give yourselves a warm round of applause. With that, the last thing I'm going to ask you is for those of you who are here today for the first time. Let me see you. Here for the first time. Let me see your hands. Here for the first time. Give them a warm round of applause. I'd like to personally thank you that are here for the first time for honoring us and this home with your presence. 
is one of the greatest charities you could offer is your beautiful presence. But now I'm going to have to ask you that if you believe that what you've heard in the work, the great work of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, under the teachings of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, if you know and recognize it to be good, that good cannot be good just for the sake of it being good to us. If it's not good to you, and if it's also good to you, then it means it should be good for more than just you and me. And in order for it to get to more than just you and me, I need you to make a stand today. All of you who would like to find out more how you can get actively involved in this great work of mental and spiritual resurrection of our people, get involved in the work of healing the sickness that is in our communities. I want you just to stand up on your feet. If you're here for the first time, stand up with me now, come on. Don't be shy, stand up. Stand up. All praise is due to Allah. Now right where you are, right where you are. Right where you are, I'm gonna ask you to do something else. I'm, you never believe this, but I'm a very shy person. Really, I am. I just talk loud. But I would like you to come down front, and I'd like to give you this card. On this card is everything we just said. And I'd like to have the distinct honor, and believe me, it is an honor and a blessing to shake your hand. My hand is not important, but it symbolizes and represents the hand of all your sisters and brothers who are more than happy and honored that you took the time to come out and be with us today. I'd like you to come down front. I'd like to shake your hand and give you this card. And then, are they to follow um, uh, the secretary? And the secretary here, you'd follow him, and he will inform you more times of meeting and all of the different information that you must have as you leave. So if you would please, sisters and brothers, come down front. Give me that opportunity to just welcome you here. I thank you. All oh, praise is due to Allah. All of our beautiful brothers and sisters that are uniting this day to accept the challenge of doing something for themselves and helping the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to make a change in our communities. Brothers to the right, sisters to the left, and all of us that are seated, let us continue to give our brothers and sisters a warm round of applause. Let us show them that we appreciate their stand this day to do something for themselves and something for our community and our nation. Keep your applause going. Don't let it tire as our beautiful sisters come forward to shake the hand of our regional minister, Rasul Mohammed. Let's hear it from Minister Rasul Mohammed and this timely message, our culture, the culture of God. Our sisters continue to come forward to shake the hand of our beloved minister this afternoon. Let us continue to make way for our sisters to come forward as Minister Rasul Mohammed shakes the hand of our powerful young men. All praises due to Allah. This is the day that we have been waiting for. This is the day that we have been looking forward to during our sojourn here in America, the day that the black man and woman would take a stand to do something for themselves, something on behalf of their suffering communities and families. All praise is due to Allah. Look at the beautiful black men as they come forward to shake the hand of Minister Rasul Mohammed to accept the challenge this day to make love a reality in their lives and love a reality in the lives of their families and our communities. All praise is due to Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his message of truth this day to empower our nation that we may move forward. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. 
All praise is due to Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his servant among us, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and his message of truth given to us today by Minister Rasul Muhammad. As the men continue to come forward to shake the hand of Minister Rasul Muhammad, all praise is due to Allah. The rise of the black man and woman of America cannot be averted this day. All praise is due to Allah. As our brothers continue to come forward, young powerful men, even down into the teenagers and preteens, they are coming forward to unite with truth, to accept this message and to take a mighty stand today in their life, to make a difference in their life, in the life of their families and in the lives of those who live in our communities. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. The last few brothers are coming forward. All praise is due to Allah. Look at the young soldiers. As the last two young brothers shake the hand of Minister Rasul Muhammad. Let's hear it for all of our brothers and sisters that stood up today. And let's hear it for Minister Rasul Muhammad. Allahu Akbar. All praise is due to Allah. This is my, uh, my brother. Last time we checked. <laughs> <laughs> the last time we checked. But he delivered a timely message, a message that I thoroughly and immensely enjoyed. These kind of subjects are the kind of subjects that empower us as a people. And I want to say to you, my dear brother and sister, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad never involved us or believed that he should involve his followers in marches that protest but do not empower us as a community. That act of violence that we all abhor, we cannot change that racist mind. I'm going to say that again. No slogans of be human <laughs> are going to change the mind of white folks. In Bridgeport, or in Evanston, or in Hyde Park, or in Miami, or in San Francisco, or New York, or Houston, or Dallas, that is a racist mind. And the pervasive attitude of white folks is that they feel they are superior. The only effective way that we will change that mind is that we must ourselves change our way of thinking which will change the conditions under which we presently live. Now, brothers and sisters, the nation of Islam, we are no punks. Right. And we are no cowards. Right. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad kept us from involving ourselves in marches in the 60s with the civil rights movements, or participating with our brothers that decided to take up arms like those in the Black Panther Party. You see, when you pick up an arm that was manufactured by your enemy, meaning he got power over those arms, and what he is allowed to come into the community, he's got bigger ones and more powerful ones to release and let loose on us. Therefore, we must be very wise today. And even though they continue to brutalize, abuse, and beat and kill our people, not only in Bridgeport and in other areas of Chicago that don't even surface on the news, this is something happening on a daily basis. But because of our disunity, 
We cannot effectively demand justice and that beast give us justice because we're so divided as a people. Now, brothers and sisters, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad believed that we must first come in, as Minister Rasul so eloquently spoke to today, into a house, into a, a place where we repair ourselves, get to learn who we are. Because as long as you don't know who you are, then you don't know your aim and your purpose for life. And you are... Uh, going around identifying yourself in the titles and the labels and the name and the cultures that our enemies have put on us. Therefore, we never approach him uh, and we never into, into a situation where there's a win-win. We're always losing. Hmm? Now, I'm telling you, as Minister Rasul said, and as that sister said before she left us, if we're really busy, or serious rather, about improving the conditions of our community. It does begin with self. And so the pledge that you made and we made today and that we always make to improve ourselves spiritually, morally, mentally, physically, and economically for the benefit of ourselves, our families, and our community. That can't happen until you're serious about making a change with yourself. And so, brothers and sisters, when we are become united, then and only then can we take power to power to make a difference. But that racist mind won't even give you the time of day. Because when the Negroes get together, not black people, not a cultivated and a refined people, we get together to vent out our dissatisfaction hmm? against their prejudice and their hatred and their racism. But then what? We rally in a church. Everybody gets a chance to vent off and say, you know, what is burning in their hearts, then what? Huh? Then business as usual? You continue to put your money in their banks? You continue to punch in and out of their clocks on their, at their uh, 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 jobs and their places of employment? Then what? See, white folks won't respect you until you find out who you are and then act upon that knowledge. That's why the knowledge of self is essential to our rise and our deliverance and we will never be able to effectively demand justice until you have justified your existence. That's the messenger's philosophy. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was just waiting because his God and our God, he already has promised them the destruction. There's no question the Bible speaks of that. But right now, brother and sister, be very premature of us to wage any war against them. In the state that we're in, we'll get smashed in a minute like ants rolled over. And for what? We took a stand. No, the minute that we wage battle, it means we are going all the way to victory is ours. So, brother and sister, what we're looking at and what we're dealing with and what our dear beloved minister gave to us today is for your serious consideration. Love is a verb. It demands that you be proactive. And it is the embodiment of certain principles carried into practice. Stop saying you love yourself, love your community, but you are not involved in doing anything that is of meaningful difference for your community. So let's start with ourselves. And when white folks see that, see, the reason why they fear Elijah Muhammad, fear Louis Farrakhan, so when we step in, brother, we ain't stepping out. We go all the way. 
And believe me, brother and sister, when you cultivate yourself, then you won't have to ask white folks or any other folk outside of your community to respect you. You won't be some foolish Roger Dangerfield ain't getting no respect. That's how we are, ain't getting no respect. You have to command respect by the way you carry yourself. And as long as white folks see you killing each other, huh? Raping your own women, right. abusing your women right. and your children, right. and fathers abusing their daughters, they don't have a reason to respect us until we learn to respect ourselves. So when we went to Washington, we didn't go to march. That was a assembly and a gathering to make a demand on ourselves. Instead of making a demand on white folks, we got to make that demand on ourselves. And when we make that demand on ourselves and then fulfill that demand, then white folks will respect you and bow your head. And I'm telling you, white folks, no matter how evil they are, when Louis Farrakhan steps into a television studio or a radio broadcast studio, you see their heads bowing down to that man that they hate. No, I didn't come to teach another subject. He spoke. The preacher has preached. But I want you to know how serious his message was to us today if we are serious about combating racism and this hatred that is building in white folks for us. Now, I'm going to put this on your thought just for consideration. If God permitted the white man to do what he did to us 400 years ago by bringing us over here, if he lets that hatred that white folks have of us, if he releases it, and Brother Farrakhan has been warning us of their plans for us if we don't get our act together. Look, brother and sister, God don't care nothing about the color of your skin. If you're not right with him, he will mow us over with, with his own enemies to teach us a lesson and he will let loose their hatred of us he's done this before the so-called Muslims were tortured killed by the powerful Mongols under Genghis Khan with all of their Islam God let a disbelieving people rise up and from China, they went westward all the way to Europe, destroying the literature, the scholarship of the Muslims and killing them because they had deviated from God. No matter how strong uh, Saddam Hussein said, Allahu Akbar, with all of his sayings of God is the greatest, God used Bush and the enemy to teach those that claim God a lesson. See, there's one thing. White folks really don't claim God. <laughs> they really do not claim God. They use God to shield their own dirty religion, but they really don't claim God. So everybody that claims God mm, are responsible and will be held accountable. So let's make a difference. This spring and summer, we got to go to work in our communities and cleaning them up and bringing our people up to a higher consciousness. May Allah bless all of you. Should we invite Brother Minister Rasul back to Chicago? I love him and he inspires me. I guess you can tell we're we're both from the same loins because there's one thing I always try and put in your mind. We must focus on the new to go back 
is counterproductive. We must move forward because the God that's present promises to make all things new. So in the next few weeks, we will invite Minister Rasul back to deliver part two of this subject or a new one that God blesses him to come up with. Thank you, Minister Rasul Muhammad. Let's hear it one more time for the seventh regional minister of the Nation of Islam, Minister Rasul Hakim Muhammad. Oh, you blew, Chief. Now, I'm going to close this out quickly. First of all, there are brothers and sisters from Kentucky here, aren't they? Did Louisville come? No? Guess they didn't make it. Is everybody here from Chicago? This is just Chi-Town? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> this was truly a resurrection of the dead. Well, we want to close very quickly with charity. Charity, right? You made the pledge, right? That you would give of your talent, your energy, and whatever you could spare of your finances, right? To help this nation under the leadership of Minister Farrakhan build schools, and factories, hospitals, huh? buy farmland into international trade and commerce. I'm asking you, dear brother and sister, not to be stingy or niggardly, holding back. I want you to give what you're able to give because Minister Farrakhan intends to...